Okay, then I guess I can start. So welcome everybody. Today at the Origin Seminar, we host Marlies Aru from the European Southern Observatory. Marlies obtained a bachelor degree in physics in 2017 from the University of Tartu in Estonia. Then she moved to the University of Lish in Belgium to pursue a master's degree in space sciences. In her thesis, she worked to estimate capabilities of METIS on the ELT to characterize exoplanets. In 2019, she joined European Space Agency as a young graduate trainee to investigate the micrometeoroid impacts on the Gaia spacecraft. In 2022, Marilee started a PhD at ESO, so European Southern Observatory, in Germany. And she's pushing VLT Muse instrument to its very limits to study proplets, irradiated protoplanetary disks around young stars. And today we will have this pleasure to hear and learn about these amazing objects from the Muse perspective. Marilise, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for this nice introduction, Dominica. And also thank you all for joining today. So as uh, Dominica introduced, I will be talking about the irradiated disks known as proplets today. And I have recently entered my third and final year of the PhD at ESO studying these objects. So I'm excited to show you some uh, data that we have been working on. I particularly work closely with Carlo Banara and Karina Mauko. So uh, you already know Karina from one of the previous talks and I will expand on uh, some of our research uh, today. And uh, yes, Dominica's pronunciation was perfect. My name is Marilis Aru. Don't be scared of all the vowels. We just like to double them in Estonian. <laughs> and I will in particular talk about three projects today. To begin with, I want to mention that I'm based at the Wanda group of Carlo Manara. And here is our team. We are part of the wider star and planet formation community at ESO, and we focus on different directions uh, related to the protoplanetary disks. We focus on the origin of disk structures, uh, accretion, the effect of the environment on planet formation, which is my focus, and uh, in the future also exploring faraway regions. Most of what we know about protoplanetary disks comes from these low mass star forming regions, such as Taurus, that are closest to us. And here you can see this uh, makeshift plot with the UV field strength versus stellar density. When we move on from these uh, low mass star forming regions into higher UV environments, actually, these are the, the places where most stars form and they have a large number of stars and this very high UV field strength. So I'm sure that you're familiar with Trample 14 that, for example, Dominica is studying and NGC uh, 1977, that is maybe the hard project of Serena, right? When I was looking for an image for NGC 1977, I realized that a nickname for this uh, one is the Running Man Nebula. And of course, not to be confused with the running chicken nebula. And here is a more precise plot compared to the previous one, where you can see the distribution of star forming regions, given their far UV luminosities based on models. So here you can see the stark difference in the number of member stars between uh, the low mass star forming region Taurus and the ONC or the Orion Nebula cluster here and the difference in their far UV luminosity as well. But when it comes to these low UV environments, we are looking at isolated disks. And in that case, the mechanisms that are at play and that govern their evolution is originating from the photons that originate from the central host star. And in that case, we are calling the um, mechanism internal photoevaporation. So I'm making a distinction later between external photoevaporation, and I'm just um, emphasizing this in here because often it can also be just referred to as simply photoevaporation. Or another process is related to the related to the MHD winds. 
And in both of these cases, these mechanisms can be uh, studied through forbidden line emission observations. The surrounding environment is important to, to be studied because it affects the evolution of the disks and in turn their ability to form planets. So when we have these high UV environments with massive stars, so O and B type stars present, the UV photons heat the disk material. And in turn, the disk material in these outer regions of the disk become unbound. In turn, there is this uh, comet-shaped cloud of ionized gas with an ionization front that surrounds this central disk that is marked with this brown color in here. And these systems are called proplids. Now, when we have this continuous UV radiation acting on the disk, it leads eventually to the dispersal of the disk, and therefore it reduces the disk lifetime, like the wind erodes rocks over time here on Earth. And um, when we think back about these very well-studied cases of disks, so for example, the HL Tau in here, we now are moving onto these kind of systems with these teardrop-shaped clouds instead, which are the characteristic shapes of this affected plane. And these objects have been studied at different UV field strengths, moving from intermediate to strong uh, fields. The, this uh, external photo operation has a number of implications on planet formation. So for example, focusing on the chemistry of the disk, the formation processes or structures, um, there are different like open questions and directions that are being explored. So for example, it has been found that the conditions for terrestrial planet formation can also happen in these extreme environments. While from the formation process point of view, uh, it has been found that pebble accretion is sensitive to external photo operation. And uh, also the uh, presence of substructures has been studied and it has been found that the presence of substructures outside this photo operation radius uh, can lead to the dust components of the disk to uh, disperse more quickly. And one of the open questions is the lifetime problem of proplets, which I will come to later. And um, also the um, entanglement of these external and external effects and the winds. So coming to the motivation for my BHD, we have these two different mechanisms at play. So one is happening in both low mass and massive star forming regions, and the other happening only in massive star forming regions. But they both lead to the forbidden line emission. So the question arises on which lines and line ratios, uh, line ratios should we use to disentangle these two effects. And in order to study that, we are looking at the proplids in the ONC. The uh, proplids there are, uh, so to say, prototype proplids because they were the very first protoplanetary disks to be found. And so the term proplet actually is just a contraction of, of the term because they were the first ones to be found. The ONC is a great region for us to study because it's the closest massive region of star formation with hundreds of different proplets. And here you can see a Hubble view of the ONC with a zoomed in view of one particular proplet as seen with VLT Muse versus the Hubble image. The early studies focused on various observational properties of these uh, proplets, but they were carried out in, in a limited number of filters. And there were also high resolution spectroscopic studied, um, sorry, carried out for a ha handful of these proplets. So you can see some of the examples of the filters used in here. And there is a very nice uh, H-alpha planetary camera view of various proplets as well. But today I want to focus on MUSE. MUSE is a multi-unit spectroscopic explorer. It is an integral field spectrograph. And this video illustrates the power of MUSE. 
So you can see us scanning through this uh, optical wavelength that MUSE covers, and the observations have been taken in narrow field mode. So the field of view is given in here, and some of the observational parameters are, are also given in here. And here we are scanning through one system, and uh, it all comes down to this RGB view in the end. In our sample, we have 12 crop plates that were observed with MUSE. So in here, in this graph, you can see the main UV source, theta 1 or EC, and a bunch of crop plates surrounding it. You can see this illustration of external photo evaporation really well, because you can notice that the tails of the crop plates are all pointing away from the culprit, that is the UV source in here. So you can see the tails pointing in that direction, opposite of the UV source, or here diagonally. While in here, um, the proplet is very small, but the um, tail is again pointing in the opposite direction. There is a second UV source, theta 2 or EA, that is in the lower corner here. And there are a few proplets also uh, nearby that UV source. So there is one very interesting target, um, 244440, that is a bit of an outlier in terms of the shape, as you can see. And that's because it might be uh, irradiated by these two UV sources both. But this is a uh, part of uh, still uh, studies. And another reason that this sample was chosen for the observations is that they're at different distances from the main uh, UV source. So they cover different levels of ionization. Now, with this MUSE data, we have a wealth of forbidden emission lines that have been detected. And this is particularly important because we can spatially distinguish the different parts or components of each system. So in here, you can see, for example, in the first panel in H-alpha, the ionization front. Then there is uh, the disk visible in here, but still some emission also from the rest of the proplet in oxygen 1, 6300. Then there is the tail, the elongated tail visible in the sulfur line, the cusp or the brightest part of the system, and then the RGB view. We can measure this ionization front radius, which is a very useful parameter in different levels of ionization uh, thanks to these emission lines. Uh, here you can see how we measure it. So uh, it's a parameter that uh, we measure from the location of the central star to the peak of emission uh, here. We plotted this uh, parameter against the projected separations from theta 1c in these uh, figures here. And um, these ionization front radii are given here in four different tracers. The purple uh, curves here mark the mass loss rates. What I want to mention before uh, is that the ionization front radii uh, are increasing at larger projected separations from the massive star for all of the tracers that are used. So basically the what we uh, what I want to highlight here is that we have a larger ionization front uh, radius at lower uh, ionization rates. So the closer the probably would be to the star, the more compact the ionization front, front radius would be. And um, I mentioned the mass loss rate. So the this ionization front radius is very useful because it allows us to empirically infer the mass loss rate of prop plates, and that's a critical factor to study their evolution. But in this case, we are estimating uh, the upper limit of the mass loss rate because we are making a little bit of an uh, approximation. We are using um, the projected separation, not the 3D distance, because that's more tr tricky to obtain, and the number of incoming photons. Here I am plotting the mass loss rate against the UV radiation field that we express in G0. And um, you can notice that this mass loss rate is a slowly decreasing function of the, of the UV field strength. And that is in agreement with models. So actually the purple line here 
is uh, taken from a paper from an ID9. Assumptions for the models varied a little bit compared to the, the proplets um, because they took some assumptions like the disk mass. So I think that would uh, shift a little bit the curve, but more or less we see that the trend agrees with each other. And we get these really high mass loss rate values. So uh, 10 to the minus seven to 10 to the minus six solar masses per year. And these values are in agreement compared to other measurements in the other uh, regions. So for example, this is a higher mass loss uh, rate than in NGC 1977, where the uh, UV field um, is a uh, weaker, it's more of an intermediate uh, field, and it's also higher than in NGC 2024. And again, you can see the outlier here, the diamond, which is the probably the 244440. And as I mentioned, it's also pre uh, peculiar in terms of its shape. And now, uh, finally, I wanted to show the mass loss rates versus disk masses from ALMA. And what you can see as these um, horizontal lines here are the lifetimes of the proplets. But I first wanted to uh, show these really nice ALMA images and VLA images of the proplets which also um, differentiate really nicely between the disk and the ionization front. The different colors here rely on the different um, dust temperatures assumed. So just so you know that some of the targets are here uh, twice. But what I wanted to uh, yes mention is that um, plotting these two parameters helps us to estimate this evaporation time scale, which is related to this mass loss problem that I mentioned earlier. So what we can see here is that the um, disk, uh, or the, sorry, the evaporation time scales are extremely rapid. So the lowest value we get is 2.4 to 130 kilo years. But at the same time, the ages of the ONC stars are 1 to 2 mega years. So there are uh, a number of different solutions that could alleviate this um, problem or this uh, discrepancy between these very different uh, lifetimes. So um, in this part, I have uh, presented the first project of my PhD. And with this paper, I wanted to demonstrate the power of Muse and what we can do with this uh, sample and what it uh, promises us to do, but also to uh, kind of uh, confirm that uh, our values uh, agree with both of the models and the observations. Now I want to move to the second project. And that is linked to an emission line, carbon emission line at 8727 angstroms. So this uh, forbidden carbon emission line was first presented uh, in, di in two disks, also in the ONC, uh, in a paper by Tom Haworth. And you can see um, a figure of these two disks in here. So this line uh, in particular was uh, studied in 1991. The line was uh, predicted to be emitted from the recombination of carbon ions. And um, the conditions for this line to arise would be dense clouds that are subject to high radiation fields, which matches the, um, the environment of the ONC. Now, there has been a very uh, a much recent paper uh, revisiting this, this uh, line and the mechanism of, uh, of how it is emitted. And they found that this line instead should form via uh, de-excitation cascades that follow from FUV pumping, pumping from the ground state. It's interesting that at the same time as the uh, more modeling-based uh, paper was published, we were also looking into this line. And we did find it in each of the 12 proplets in our sample. So it is detected in each target. And to study it more in detail, um, so now this is the uh, second paper, which is available as of last week. And we, we used this overlap with uh, ALMA observations to plot uh, color maps that you can see in here 
there are three um, views of the same target. And um, in the three uh, columns, there are uh, three different emission lines. So the white contours are MUSE observations, and they're all um, three emission lines that are uh, arising close to the disk. And I just wanted to mention that the angular resolutions between these two different observations are quite similar, so it holds up. And what I, what I wanted to highlight uh, in this comparison, now that we, where we have this, in the first column, we have this uh, oxygen-155-77 line. In the middle column, there is the oxygen-16300. Uh, and in the third one, we have this carbon-1 line. So I highlighted this uh, middle panel in here to draw attention to their differences. Compared to these two oxygen lines that you can see in here, this carbon-1 line is pinpointing to the disk most clearly. The interesting thing is that this um, C1 line is really retracing this elliptical shape of the disk that we expect because it's a highly inclined disk. And this spatial location of the line strongly is strongly suggesting that it is originated on the disk surface. And now when we revisit these uh, panels of different components of the proplets, we have the addition here of this carbon-1 line. And compared to the oxygen-1-6300 line, which uh, has uh, contributions from both the ionization front and the disk, we now have a very nice isolated view of the disk instead. And another thing to note is that based on these MUSE contours, these two oxygen one lines are not co-spatial. The oxygen one lines, uh, the reason that we were also interested in those is that they are really common in the case of studying internal photo evaporation. When we compare instead the C1 line in different star forming regions from low mass star forming regions to a higher mass one like Sigma Ori, we can see that we barely detect the C1 line in the low mass uh, star forming region case. While, um, and the detection is less than 10% of uh, 77 X shooter spectra. But I also want to mention that this less than 10% is actually just a tentative detection. So we wouldn't expect it to arise in these uh, low UV conditions. So this is a tentative detection. The detection rate is increasing to 40% in the case of Sigma Orionis, and we are detecting it in each proplet for the case of the ONC. This is really nicely fitting with the uh, paper by Javier Goicoetxea. Uh, and one of the findings of that paper was that the intensity of the uh, carbon line scales with G0 or the UV field strength, which is exactly what we retrace observationally as well. Therefore, um, this C1 line is an emission line that is pinpointing to the disk and at the same time or the base of the wind. And it is emerging in the conditions of external photo operation. So it could be especially valuable to us when we go into these regions where we cannot uh, resolve the proplets anymore. So when we move into studying the external photo operation in faraway regions, where we are not maybe so sure whether the effect is uh, happening or whether uh, it's internal photo operation instead. So this is something that can help us disentangle the external and internal winds. To follow up the study of this line, we um, have recently uh, gotten data with UVs, which is a high resolution spectrograph at VLT. And here I wanted to just um, show you an example of the spectra that we have with MUSE. So you can see that the line looks extremely broad in here, but this is due to the resolution of MUSE because we actually expect quite a narrow profile. So here is the theoretical line profile uh, for different values of G0, although for oxygen one line, but uh, we would expect something similar also for C1 um, that is taken from the paper of Giulia Palabio. 
And now when we are looking into the UVs data, we do see something much more narrow as we have a much higher resolution. So this is just a, a preliminary example that we have gotten for this uh, same target, which I showed the morphology for. So it's uh, quite exciting to look at this line in more detail because we have um, recently gotten the spectra for all of the 12 droplets in our sample. So this study will continue and carry on um, also uh, by using the spectra. Now, these have been the two projects that I have been working on so far. And what I'm doing uh, now uh, for the final project is background subtraction. So what we want to move to is estimate the line ratios. In order to uh, get these line intensities of different emission lines, we have to estimate where we have just the uh, contribution from the propylate itself and not from the background. So I've been uh, working on just uh, isolating the propylate itself. And this will allow us to calculate the physical properties of the proplate, so the electron temperature and the density. And in turn, this will allow us to have a more refined value of the mass loss rate as well. So in conclusion, uh, I hope I have convinced you that MUSE opens up new perspectives on how we study proplates. And it allows us to characterize the morphology of proplates at different ionization levels. And we are using a gallery of spectral line tracers for that. And this uh, C1 line is a telltale tracer for the photo operating disks, which also agrees with the newest models. And then I'm happy to move on to these uh, physical properties of the proplates, have a more comprehensive view of the systems as well. So. I will leave here the references of the papers and my contact. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. So is there any questions in the Zoom or online? If you want to speak online, you can just unmute yourself or you can raise your hand and or uh, them. Or you can just uh, type into the chat if you uh, don't have a microphone. Um, I have a question. I don't know if this is something that uh, people who do disks know, but can you, on slide 27, you looked at the um, oxygen one lines as well as the um, C1 line. Can you tell me what it means that they're not co-spatial? Yes, so um, basically what we are seeing is that there are different processes that cr uh, create these lines. We're seeing different physical mechanisms. So this helps us to say that the way that the oxygen 163 line, for example, is being emitted is different from the mechanism of the oxygen 155-77 line. Okay. And did you find any specifics as to what those mechanisms are? I, I ended up not including a slide on that. <laughs> but uh, yes, so there are several um, like ways that this problem could be alleviated. Um, one of them is the shielding of the UV radiation. So since we, when we look at the ONC, um, sorry. So if we look at the ONC, we see all this nebulosity in the region, right? So there are different parts of the nebula that basically could act as a shield to hold some of the uh, radiation from coming, th coming through and uh, peering through the disk. And there was a paper, like uh, a modeling paper that was published, I think, two years ago um, that said that this could play an effect. But I think that it's like a work in progress to say how much it can protect the proplates, because I think the shielding should take place for a very long time, right? But I guess it could play a little bit of a role. Um, then there is also the... Um, possibility that we are just kind of observationally biased because we're looking at these very close proplates to the um, UV source and maybe we just sh should like expand our sample and go into further regions. And also everything in the ONC can be in movement, right? So it's also maybe a possibility that the 
uh, this car just not staying close to the UV source for so long. That yeah, so this could also play a role. I'm sure that Serena is a better expert at, the, at this part than me, but I think yeah, like, I would then, say yeah. So you, I think you mentioned that well. Lin Chao et al. Um, paper worked on the shielding by the dust. Um, that could be about that could explain like a half a million year of shielding time. Then it, it's not that much dis discrepant anymore. But I think they're still work more working on more um, about that uh, shielding processes. And then, as Marilis mentioned, dynamics. So the kinematically, some of the massive stars are kind of fly by in a way that they were moving in a direction toward those young stars. And they actually did spend too much time, but that depends on cases. Like in ONC, yeah. they might have been shielding because the massive stars and proplates move together. They are born in, seems like they are from the same cloud. But in 1977, the massive star moved in. So that could explain something different. Okay, yeah. thank you. And also, yeah, also just to to uh to mention once more that